So a couple minute break, um, or we're gonna, we can go straight into this fireside chat. First up, I wanna say um, thank you to a young gentleman named Ben McNally. Ben McNally is an intern with us. I think he's 26, 27 years old. He's a student at the LBJ school. Absolutely brilliant uh, young man. Uh, he is um, very, uh, I call him an old soul. I think he would probably live three or four lives. I don't know, but he's very well read. He, he knows stuff from back in the day that I've forgotten or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, he has a lot of initiative and he, and I'll tell you, Ben, it's good to see you there, sir. Uh, you are the hope of our nation. Um, your, your initiative um, the, that you've just demonstrated, the uh, uh, value that you've created and helping us put these events on is greatly appreciated. And I want to thank you for reaching out to our next guest that you're going to have the honor of introducing reaching out to him and his team, et cetera, initiating conversation, connecting us with Admiral Inman. Uh, I wanna thank you for your service to us and your service to the entire nation in terms of helping us put these programs on. So welcome, Ben, glad you're with us and glad you're on our team. Hey, thank you very much, David. Um, hey, thank you for your kind words. It's an honor to be involved in America's Future Series. And it's an honor to be here discussing uh, cybersecurity here with all of you today. Uh, it's an issue that uh, truly touches all aspects of our society, from people who work in power plants to people at the NSA to corporate America. And today we have the honor of talking with two individuals who bring unique perspectives on the cyber issue. Uh, the first is uh, Suzanne Kelly, who is the publisher and CEO of the Cypher Brief, and the second is uh, retired Navy Admiral Bobby Inman. Uh, Suzanne uh, is, as I mentioned, the CEO and publisher of the Cypher Brief, which is a digital publication providing original and curated content on national security and global security issues. She also runs the Cypher Brief's annual threat conference in Sea Island, Georgia, and is a former intelligence correspondent for CNN, where she co-founded and co-developed the Security Clearance Blog. Uh, her first book, Master of War, Blackwater USA's Eric Prince and the Business of War, was published by HarperCollins in 2009, and offer the only inside look at the rise and fall of the private security contractor Blackwater. Kelly also spent nine years working as a news anchor for CNN International based in Atlanta and in Berlin. She's currently working on a second book and also serves on the board of the Special Operations Care Fund, which is run by a great friend of mine, uh, David Kramer. Admiral Bobby Inman became an adjunct professor at the University of Texas at Austin in 1987. He was appointed a tenured professor holding the Lyndon B. Johnson Centennial Chair in National Policy in August 2001. He also served as interim dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs in 2005, and again from January 2009 to March 2010. Inman served in the U.S. Navy from November 1951 to July 1982, retiring with the permanent rank of Admiral. On active duty, he served as director of the National Security Agency and Deputy Director of Central Intelligence. After retirement from the Navy, Inman was Chairman and CEO of the Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation, also known as MCC in Austin, Texas for four years, and Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Westmark Systems, Inc., a privately owned electronics industry holding company for three years. Inman also served as Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas from 1987 through 1990. His primary business activity since 1990 has been investing in startup technology companies, serving as managing director of Geffenor Ventures and Limestone Capital Advisors. He serves as trustee of the American Assembly and the California Institute of Technology, and as an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Kelly and Admiral Bobby Inman to the America's Future Series. Hey, Ben, thank you. I appreciate that. Um... I uh, am I'm honored to be invited. It was really fun. I should brag for just a moment um, that the Cypher Brief was very lucky to have you uh, as a, an intern as well. So uh, America's Future Series, you're lucky. We know what value you're getting with Ben. Um, and we'd like to thank you for inviting myself and the Cypher Brief to be a part of the conversation. Um, do we have Admiral Inman connected? Well, it seems that we might be having some cyber issues at the cybersecurity. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the bad okay, guys are trying right? to hack him. Okay. So Suzanne, hi, this is Dave Hamilton. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Dave. How are you doing? Good. Well, I want to say thank you for doing this. And I think we might start off a little bit by having you talk a little bit about yourself and uh, the Cypher Brief. Uh, we're big fans of your work. And I think uh, our listeners, our, our viewers, would love to learn a little bit about more about you and the work you do. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I launched the Cypher Brief in 2015 after a career of being a journalist um, at places like CNN and others. 
um, worked overseas for a while and decided that I really wanted to provide something on a digital platform that allowed people to get a broader context of what's going on in the news. So instead of, uh, you know, like we're about to talk to Admiral Inman about a series of events going on um, in the national security world today, looking at experts like that to provide a broader context so that we can understand how events that happen overseas impact us here in the United States. So I was very fortunate to, um, to launch this with a host of support from all sides of the political spectrum. So we're non-political, but um, we uh, went out to a series of experts that you can find on our website at thecipherbrief.com slash experts, including General Michael Hayden, General Jack Keane, a whole bunch of people that Admiral Inman has worked with in the past and that I'm sure um, all of your audience today would be familiar with as well. And we just provide national security content and analysis. So it's a fun, challenging job, uh, not only in a world where media is being turned upside down, media platforms are, but then COVID of course hit. And one of our biggest events is an event we do every year in Sea Island, Georgia, which is um, a private invite only event where we focus on the public and private sectors coming together uh, to tackle a lot of these major issues that we're facing. So um, sort of right, right in uh, your lane too. It's so nice to be able to partner with like-minded organizations that put these priorities first and put a real focus on expert conversations on a very respectful level. So we're happy to be a part of this as well. well it's an honor to have you. And um, we would be honored if you have time in a couple of weeks, we, you know, we have another, next week we have another event uh, and we uh, have an opening if your schedule allowed it, we'd love to invite you back for that. That's and then great. on September 28th, we have our big Defense Innovation Summit, et cetera, with Mattis, Petraeus, McChrystal, and others. And so we look forward to working with you. Hopefully have uh, you guys moderate a panel or something like that on that, on that event as well. Yeah, the nature yeah. of the work that you do is really important. And all we're trying to do is pro provide a platform for people like yourselves uh, who do what you do. So yeah. we'd love to have you involved in any of all those programs. And uh, people you know, need to go out to the Cypher Briefs website and learn about the events that you're having, the virtual ones as well as the physical ones, right? Yeah, absolutely. We just did our first cybersecurity summit um, as well. And you know, when I was looking out at kind of the range of cyber cybersecurity summits that are out there, there are a lot. So we kind of selectively partner with those that we think really bring great value to the conversation and work right alongside them instead of looking at them as competitors because we're sort of practicing what we preach, which is you've got to be a part of the broader community to be a part of the solution. No one's going to get there on their own. And that includes creating forums like this one, where you have really expert driven dialogue around cybersecurity and other geopolitical issues, like we'll talk about in a few minutes. So um, we, we would love to participate with you and be a part of that. Um, and the whole virtual world has been new for us. You know, a lot of our uh, gatherings were in person initially um, for our first few years of existence. We do some private salons in Georgetown when we were based up in Washington, but COVID kind of turned everything upside down and we've learned very quickly. Thank goodness we have a former uh, Green Beret on our team who gave him a task and he has figured out how to, how to bring everything that we do with the Cypher Brief to the virtual world. So we're excited about that. And then since we have just a moment, it looks like we're still trying to get Admiral Inman connected. Um, we also have something interesting that I'd like to invite you to um, come be a part of, which is our international summit uh, which is happening in May. And, you know, we deal with a lot of experts from intelligence agencies, um, particularly from around the world, a lot of the Five Eyes Alliance agencies. And for the nerdy national security viewers, you're going to know what Five Eyes is if you don't mm -hmm. Google it. I know yeah, Ben okay. McNally knows what it is. Um, and we'll be talking with a lot of those people about how emerging technologies are impacting the future of alliances, um, alliances that share intelligence information. Um, if you're not a part of the Alliance, how do you partner with the Alliance? How do you look at which countries are trusted with how they gather intelligence information and share it? So we have a, a lot of opportunity there um, to talk with colleagues overseas. Um, I think when you look at some of the rising threats today that we're dealing with, um, a lot of them are geopolitical in nature. You have threats from Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and alliances are the future. Um, no one's going to be able to do this alone. And I think that's important. So We'll be having those important conversations. We haven't even announced it yet, but now you got me talking. Um, oh, we'll be yeah, announcing yeah. that publicly. Man, so please do, time. please do, do a yeah. shameless plug for us if you will. Give people your website. <laughs> yes, and, I'd be happy to. <laughs> give that and, and tell them when the, the date of this event in May. Yeah, it's thecipherbrief.com is our website. You can sign up there for a free daily newsletter. 
Um, we put out a great open source report every morning. Um, if you can't read it, we do a podcast version of it. So you can download that again, it's totally free. And the international summit that we are just getting ready to announce later this week is May 11th to the 13th. Um, and it's being co-hosted by one of our experts who is a former member, former senior member of the British Foreign Office, um, Nick Fishwick. So it's gonna be, I think a very good time. Fantastic. Now, are all of your slots filled? You have all the speakers that you want, all the panelists, all the moderators, that sort of thing? Not yet. People who know me know that I go down sort of a list of experts and, and start pinging people um, a couple of weeks out. And magically, they all show up. Um, we're very fortunate to have a really loyal group of experts. So we have some big names on here that we haven't announced yeah. yet. And I don't want to jump the gun too yeah, much. Yeah, don't, don't, don't shoot off all your ammo right now. But I think you're going to be really surprised at the new voices that we're bringing to folks when we're trying to understand international issues. Um, some big names dealing with some big challenges in their own countries. So we're very excited about it. Well, we're excited for you. And so I don't know if we're going to be able to have Admiral Inman on with us or not, uh, but uh, what we might do, just maybe spend four or five more minutes if we would, yeah. uh, if we can. Um, hopefully Admiral Inman can come on in that time, but if not, we'll give people a break. Yeah. Uh, these, these people can get zoomed out a little bit. I want to stress to people, there's two things about what you do that we share that we think are very, very important. Mm -hmm. One, we recognize that we're all zoomed out. Yeah. Right. And yeah. what I liked about what I know about you guys is that you try to make things highly interactive. You try to put people together and have them talk about things and discuss them. You don't have a talking head that you ask a question, they answer it, then you go to the next one, they answer it, yeah. this sort of thing, right? Um, that is not terribly interesting. Secondly, you, what you guys don't do, and this is what we don't do either, is say cyber is important. Yeah. And then say that over and over again, rinse and repeat. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're at the point where we agree that cyber is very important, that it's a matter of national security, and it's not a matter of when you'll be, I'm sorry, if you'll be hacked. Yeah. It's a matter of when and what you do about it. And what I love about what you guys do is you provide prescriptions. I, I use this word a lot. You use solutions. You talk about use cases. You have examples. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm a CEO. I'm a CIO. I'm a CISO or whatever. Great, mm -hmm. I got it. Now what? Mm -hmm. And what I love about what you guys do is you provide the now what. Yeah. We had a really cool exercise that we just conducted, and we partnered with our friend um, Dimitri Aprovich over at Silverado Policy Accelerator. Um, and he, he worked with us to put together kind of a, a mock scenario of an event happening within government. And then we went out to General Dave Petraeus and former PGD&I Susan Gordon and Jeanette Manfra, who is now at Google, but was currently or was formerly um, a deputy director over at CISA and just a host of experts um, from with all former government experience to talk about what would happen if Iran actually launched, you know, a pretty significant cyber attack against the United States and then to game that with all of those people taking the lead and taking turns and saying, you know, what would be their top priorities? How would they think about that? Can you all hear me now? That's pretty amazing. That is amazing. Welcome, Admiral. Well, thank you. I've, I've been watching you since 11 o'clock this morning, and I just finally dialed in on the telephone side to pick up sound. Uh, they're frustrated that 25 minutes uh, trying to get and never connected the television image. So, uh, Suzanne, if this is satisfactory, I'm prepared to plunge into it. I've got, I'm talking into a telephone while I'm watching you. Excellent. I think that works just fine, sir. And it's such a pleasure to be reconnected with you again. Um, and thank you so much. I just want to say off the top for your incredible service to the country. Um, both what you did while in government and leading the NSA, and then what you've done out of government in making sure that the educational institutions stay very well connected um, to the world of national security. It's just a pleasure to be talking with you. You're very kind. Thank you. So why don't we just jump right in? You know, one of the things that we had included in this morning's Cypher Brief open source report that is that just this week, Tehran is reporting its largest air incursion yet by the Chinese military with Taiwan's defense ministry saying 25 Chinese military aircraft entered into its air defense identification zone. Now this move, sir, comes a day after US Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned China against invading Taiwan. I'm kind of setting the Taiwan story for you as a way to jump into what you think the most pressing issues are when it comes to the threat to US national security currently posed by China. Where the danger of hostilities is concerned, Taiwan is at the top of the list. 
Chinese are exceedingly nervous about what the Biden administration is going to under. Will they maintain the one China like, or will they uh, reach out of hand to Taiwan and will that encourage Taiwan to declare independence? Some of the far right wing uh, professors in China have been urging for the last year that while the U.S. was distracted, this is the time to go ahead and use force to seize Taiwan and put that issue behind them. The government's not shown any interest at this point in pursuing that, but we're watching just a little steady increase of concerns. You mentioned the aircraft today. Uh, we've got a carrier and an amphibious group that are operating in the South China Sea, uh, and some of that's related to the uh, incursion in the Philippine water. So the bottom answer is that the tension has been increased. What would what would decrease it? A clear statement that Taiwan does not intend to declare independence and that we're going to maintain the status quo process we've done in the past. If that, in fact, is the U.S. intent. I don't know, just from listening, what the U.S. intent is. It'll be interesting to sort of help piece that together um, as we see some of the further statements from the Secretary of State, um, who's been very engaged on the issue of China. Um, let's stick with the topic of China for just a moment, but pivot, if we can, to the issue of espionage and counterintelligence. You know, the FBI is opening a counterintelligence case against China roughly once every 10 hours now, according to recent testimony by the FBI director, who will be on the Hill again tomorrow for the worldwide threat hearing, I just want to note. But there are also threats of China targeting universities. You know all about this story through foreign exchange students studying in the U.S., you know, this is a big deal for the university system down in Texas and across the country. How should universities be thinking about trying to mitigate the threat of espionage, but still keep the universities open for the fantastic sort of contributions that students from China are making to programs? Suzanne, let me try to split this into about three different buckets in responding. Uh, first, the reality that there is no precedent for the two largest economies in the world having totally different forms of government, totally different cultures, totally different histories. So we've got a real challenge here of how do we, in fact, collaborate where we can, build fences where we cannot to keep it from becoming hostile as opposed to adversarial. So that lingers in the, as the prime challenge for us along the way. Uh, Chinese have a massive uh, espionage process, uh, massive cyber, cyber capability in the process. They have focused overwhelmingly on U.S. industry, looking to get both the design uh, for the stealth aircraft, the F-35, which they pulled out of Lockheed Martin's database, and that was the basis for building the J-20. And we've seen a lot of it. And comparably, they've gone after uh, technology all across the private sector, which might help build the U.S. one. And there are separately espionage cases, again, targeted going after classified uh, proprietary information. There is almost no proprietary or classified research going on on university campuses. So the focus on the students is, in my view, substantially misguided. They are very bright students. The professors love to have them to pursue their research. The issue is, is that access something that is harmful to the U.S. economy? Or is it helpful? And where I tiptoe in carefully, up until 1979, we had almost no good human access inside China from 49 to 79. And then Deng Xiaoping flooded 100,000 students into the U.S. 
an amazing number of them were children, grandchildren, nieces, and nephews of the top 2,000 people of China in the process. They studied here. They learned a lot. Some of them stayed. A lot of them went back. And a lot of them had been favorably impressed with their time in the U.S. and our ability to understand what was going on inside China was significantly enhanced by those students who'd been here uh, in the process. Others who'd stayed to become professors in more recent years, they've gone back to try to enhance at Chinese universities, pushing the frontiers of emerging technologies. Bottom line, the challenge for the U.S., is not to try to hide unclassified research. It is to run faster in implementing it in the U.S. itself. And as President Xi has moved increasingly toward relying on the state-owned enterprises as opposed to the private sector, what they're going to do is lose some of their edge for innovation. So I'm less concerned about our ability to compete with China as I see them increasingly relying on the state-owned enterprises as opposed to the private sector. So the challenge for the U.S. is what we learned in competing with the Japanese uh, in the late 80s, the challenge is for the U.S. to run faster at using the technology that's emerging. Long-winded answer, I apologize. I think it's an absolutely spot on answer, sir. And and as a quick follow up there, let's talk for a moment about the private sector. You just described it as one of the U.S.'s primary strengths, the private sector. However, we've got um, issues where we're just not stepping up to the plate in new technologies and implementing them, as you also referenced. And 5G comes to mind. Um, What is it going to take for the U.S. to sort of um, be able to keep pace with some of the technology development that's going on? outside of our own country that will keep us from having to rely on things that are made in other countries that could be potential national security risks down the road? How do we inspire that kind of innovation and development even more? First, if you go back and look at uh, U.S. funding of research, it has steadily declined. If we surge back to the levels we have, I've been looking to see in uh, President Biden's uh, pretty broad spread uh, look at uh, infrastructure and competing. It's that investment in research and in encouraging it being used. Uh, The universities that are geared to support the research being commercialized, that's, that's the driving road to success in the process. And you can find universities, mostly private ones, who do that well, the public universities tend to be more reluctant, simply afraid that since it's public money, they'll be criticized for helping it get commercialized. Wrong wrong answer. The answer is fund research as broadly as you can across the universities, across private sector, and then encourage the fastest possible innovation to use that technology. And when we do, we get out in the lead. We saw that when we were afraid the Japanese were going to be at the lead of the fifth generation computing effort. It was a government funded effort. Private sector in the U.S. outstripped it. I think that's that's one of the things that we don't do enough, which is understanding um, history to um, have a broader context of what's happening today and how we think about it and things that have worked in the past um, and, and replicating those that have worked while avoiding those that didn't. Um, if you're still with me, let's let's talk about Russia here for a few minutes. You're still there? Seems like we might have another connection issue. So we'll give it just a second. Luckily, um, when I started out my career, uh, it was in television as a weather person where things always went wrong. So I just learned how to talk and talk and talk and bore people to tears. But (laughs) we'll see if we can't get that connection reestablished. And in the meantime, one of the things I really would like to talk to Admiral Inman about is kind of the threat of misinformation and disinformation and technology um, and how that's impacting where we are today. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Sorry for the technical difficulties, phones get dropped. 
It happened. You know, I guess we need one more satellite up in the uh, low Earth orbit. A U.S. made satellite would be good. Yeah, we need more of those, et cetera. I think I think someone is simply trying to cock, uh, keep the admiral from sharing his wisdom with us. I think that's a nefarious plot. But anyway, so you know, he's really Go he ahead. is spot on with a lot of these issues. Um, I mean, I, I was really looking forward to talking um, with him about Russia as well. But um, I have to say, everything he has said on China um, is absolutely spot on. I think. Um, you know, understanding the context and seeing it through his eyes is extremely valuable because like I mentioned just toward the end there, there's so much context and things that we forget. We're so overloaded with information today that I think having people like Admiral Inman on this program is great because it reminds us of where the US from a national security perspective has been strong and has overcome issues in the past that are somewhat similar to where we find ourselves today, so. So we will bring him back and we'll build, build a day around him and you. Yeah, that's great, I'm all in for that. That's great. So um, we might just spend a couple of minutes sign, sort of signing off if you want. And uh, if you would, there may be a couple of takeaways, key things that you think that uh, Admiral Inman or yourself would like the uh, public to really focus on and understand with regard to how we uh, improve our national security uh, relative to cyber, to disinformation, misinformation, et cetera. If there's anything that you'd like them to focus on and some sort of takeaways that you've experienced from the countless experts, you know, all the wisdom that you've accreted over the years from talking to these people, anything that you'd like to share with that. And then at the end, uh, let's invite the, everyone to come to your next event. Now I'm back. All right, I'm gonna step out of the way of the Admiral. You guys go for it. And Bye just now. like Apologies, that. Apologies, I don't know. Modern communications not favoring us today. today. We hear you. Well, I am so glad you're back because I did want to talk to you about Russia. Um, you know, I'm not sure, sir, if you've ever seen anything like this in your lifetime of service to the country, but this misinformation and disinformation campaigns that are being launched, they're so easy to launch because you've got a group of Americans on social media, and I'm in one of them, um, who seems to believe the first thing they see and hear. How serious do you think this threat is, and how do we position ourselves to protect against it? Susanna, I had uh, tracked Soviet active measures uh, through the bulk of my adult life, serving an intelligence community, uh, propaganda, uh, active, you know, taking out uh, defectors by, by killing them at all. The huge surprise to me was the speed with which they recognized opportunity provided by social media mm -hmm. and the skill with which they went out to implement that. We saw it clearly finally recognized it during the 2016 election. And as I tracked further, seeing their involvement at Ferguson, Missouri and Charlottesville, uh, North Carolina, what they were out Virginia, sorry, what they were out to do was to diminish confidence in democracy in the process. That's an ongoing activity. They're very sophisticated at it. Now, what unhappily, as we focus on that and understand it better and track it, we sometimes take our eye off of their parallel espionage activities in the process. In 2020, everything was focused on the entities that interfered in 2016, making sure that they weren't going to somehow manipulate the 2020 election. Well, a separate intelligence agency saw the opportunity, recognized that NSA was not permitted to track servers in the U.S., so they came in the back door and made a huge infiltration through solar winds on, I don't think we fully understand the full scale of what they accomplished or what may be left behind in the process. Um, part of the challenge, just as in 2001, when we were trying to track individual terrorists in the US related in the 9-11 attack, we were permitted to follow foreign official communications, but not private individuals and not cell phones. So the law was changed to permit coverage looking for that, 
but we didn't open up for things like domestic terrorists. Mm -hmm. The argument is over privacy versus security. Mm -hmm. And we've got some loud voices in the Senate who will object to any change of the law that might in any way impede privacy. When I pressed my graduate students on this issue, uh, they initially, the argument was, oh, we don't want the government listening to what we're doing. And then to point out that every time they go on the Internet, they're tracked everywhere they go. The final argument was, well, they could live with the government knowing as their parents, as long as their parents didn't know where they were going on the Internet. Yeah, I think that's the world we're living in. Private entities like our credit card companies or social media companies know more about us because uh, than, than the government yeah. does these days. But, you know, it's a really interesting dilemma. You bring up a good point. And we just had um, Glenn Gristel, who's a former general counsel of the NSA, um, and Chris Inglis, who's just been nominated to be the White House's cyber director, talking about this issue of NSA authorities. So we're living in a world where just a few years ago, you know, the whole disclosure by Edward Snowden and all of the emotions that that um, raised around the issue of security and privacy and the conversations about where are we comfortable setting limits came to bear. But now we've seen solar winds and solar winds has hacked US private owned companies, the government. And as you said, we're not even sure how deep um, that project for lack of a better word, um, that cyber hack went, um, that it's believed to be the Russians are behind it. But how do you see that authorities are gonna have to change? I mean, the NSA has better capabilities than any organization on earth in terms of tracking digital signatures. How would the US want to be in a position where it isn't able to continue to track the bad guys, if you will? Um, Suzanne, we need, we need to enable NSA's capabilities against any threat and focus on how do we make sure that the information collected is not used inappropriately. Minimization procedures that we've had for a very long time when you run across uh, in foreign communications suddenly talking about Americans and minimization procedures that you cannot publish anything identifying that individual without, unless it's, you know, potential, an absolute violation of the law, a target of foreign collection at all. So we know how to do the rules to ensure there is no misuse of the information collected. But if we don't, in fact, collect it, we're going to continue to be blind. We're going to be dependent on bright people at FireEye recognizing something going on and blowing a whistle because it's taking place where NSA can't look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important note. You know, we just hosted FireEye's CEO, Kevin Yandia, on the Sacred Brief a couple of weeks back, and he was giving incredible kudos to Russia for the, the sophisticated capabilities that they have um, and how they are right up there with the best in the world when it comes to this. So I think it would be naive to think that these types of breaches aren't gonna continue and maybe even more aggressively, because as you said, they spun up the capability on social media pretty quickly, I think to everyone's surprise. Um, let, me, let me kind of shift just a little bit, but keeping with the issue of technology, there were half a billion Facebook users who have had their data hacked recently as reported in the media. How does this influence the ongoing conversation about regulating social media companies? Where do you fall on that issue? I, I've not yet seen uh, any real response. Uh, and this is a sort of personal matter. I just discovered somebody seizing my own personal information had used uh, a false claim to the Texas Workforce Commission for unemployment. So I'm in the middle of trying to run down. I pay every month for two different private entities to make sure my information is not being misused. Obviously, they miss the case. We need to really rethink social media in so many different ways. It's been terrific for what it's opened up in the flow of information. But so much of that information turns out to be inaccurate, deliberately false, misleading. So how do we help protect the people who are out there reading it uh, to make sure they understand it's 
probably true. It's possibly true. It's possibly false. It's probably false. Almost like the old uh, good housekeeping seal of approval. We need something like that uh, installed. I'd prefer it be done by the private sector, not by the government. But government needs to set the standards of what's expected. And I, I would think the government would need to share information, which is another um, fun key uh, phrase uh, about what they're seeing with the public a little bit more so that the public can figure out how to put that in the context of what's happening, uh, I think, in their own lives. Um, I agree. Yeah. So let me let me ask you, um, as the government continues to kind of partner with private sector companies, you know, there are a lot of technologies that are being developed by these leading companies, Microsoft, Google, others that are fantastic um, and leading edge. But the employees sometimes who work at those companies don't always agree with how those technologies are being used. Now, this is maybe a generational um issue that we're dealing with. It might be just a political issue that we're dealing with, privacy issue, whatever it is, but it could impact future U.S. national security if they aren't able to sort of bridge that divide a little bit more closely. How much do you, how much time do you spend thinking about those issues with the gap that exists between the public and private sectors and how much better off the U.S. would be if we could close that gap? Suzanne, I worry about it a lot. It, it is a generational issue. Uh, it is a mindset. But they've been exposed in their lifetime only to Edward Snowden forward and therefore believe all these organizations are potentially spying on them and not aware of what went on through the whole Cold War, what's gone on in the 30 years subsequent to that time frame. Frankly, I find as they get a little older, their attitudes begin to change. So I think we need to hopefully educate them that this is not a threat, that in fact it may protect them. And if they have their own personal identity stolen and used, that may accelerate their education or their, their willingness to open up to the education. Uh, the government should be able to access technology which will enhance our overall security. On the other side, they should be in position to share with the private sector warnings, what potentially hostile foreign entities are doing to accelerate the ability of the private sector to recognize and deal with that. I have for some years tried to engender something like what we ran with MCC and Semitech, where you have a sharing of private sector and government uh, research looking at pushing the frontiers of threats, challenges, where the government could flow in critical information without having to reveal how we knew it. And the private sector people who participated would be the ones who say, this is how we can use that, or here is something we can use to protect us against that. Um, I've had a few senators who showed interest, but nothing has ever really moved. And I've never, maybe the Biden administration will pick up on this. Uh, the predecessors have not. Um, Admiral, what have I not asked you during our conversation today that is top of mind for you and something that you'd like for other people to keep top of mind as well as they walk away from this conference this week? I think at the heart, there are two things that would be at the heart of that issue for me. One is the trade-off between privacy and knowledge to be able to comprehend and deal with Russia and China, North Korea, Iran, uh, this cyber intrusion on a large scale is going to continue. And so we have to be better geared. How are we alert to it? How do we deal with it in the process? The other one is the one you raised on the flood of social media information, which is, which is totally inaccurate, misleading people that 33 million voters thereabouts may still believe the election was stolen is horrifying. 
the evidence is absolutely solid that it was not. There are always some minor infractions in every election. But repeated examination, there was no large scale. That still 33 million people believe it was tells me the scale of the challenge we have in front of us, the threat to democracy, if we cannot get clear understanding of false information. You know, Mr. Goebbels demonstrated for Hitler that if you repeat the big lie often enough, people will begin to believe it. And I don't know how we attack it. I, old intelligence officers tell you what the problems are, not how to solve them. It takes a community, sir. Absolutely. Well, I really want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you for overcoming the technology challenges of so that you can join us because I really find our conversation today critical. And I really find your perspective and context on these issues important. And I think one of the things that you said too that really resonates with me is on the issue of students on campuses. Um, what we're seeing now and what I think we're gonna continue to see as tensions between the US and China continue to rise are some of these hate crimes against Chinese individuals which are completely unbased um, and completely not who America is. And I, I think, sir, that you would agree with me on that note. So I think it's important to really understand the contributions and the leadership um, that Chinese Americans make um, in the community. That resonated with me when you talked about your thoughts on the issue of students and universities. And, and some of those brightest ones may want to stay and become U.S. citizens. So we should be looking for talent, not trying to exclude it. Yeah. And so the key here is you protect classified information in the government. You protect proprietary information in companies. The vast bulk of research in universities is not proprietary and it's not classified. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there it's open and our, uh, our real challenge, how quickly do we get that information translated into product services that keep this economy moving, run faster. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to leave it, sir. I wanna thank you so much for being here with us and. Again, I'd like to thank America's Future Series for inviting us to be a part of these important conversations this week. I think on the issues of national security, given the threats facing the US right now, more conversations like this are needed, not fewer. So Admiral, thank you for being here. Thank you for your efforts and for uh, being able to overcome technology failing us today. That is thank the, uh, you. The fantastic team, I think, at America's Future Series who um, shown that they're willing to and able to adapt quickly um, when things don't go always according to plan, which they never do, do they? You too, adapt Thank and you. overcome, right? Thank Bye. you, Admiral. You're we welcome. Take you care. Greatly, Bye. Admiral. Bye. All right, well, so I will turn it back over to you, but I, I want to thank you so much um, for the opportunity to talk about these important issues and for pulling this forum together. Um, I think hearing the words of wisdom from Admiral Inman is fantastic. And, you know, just his points also, one more that really resonated was the generational gap. I hadn't really ever thought of it as this next generation of leaders really didn't have um, the same threats, direct physical threats to US national security that a lot of us grew up with. And it's understandable if you don't have that context, but I think, you know, it, it helps move the conversation a little bit further if we can all get a better sense of how these threats are impacting us in our future today. So thanks for letting me be a part of it as well. well we enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my Have pleasure. a great day. Thank you. Take care. So um, I just want to uh, amplify this a little bit. We're going to take a break in a second, but um, there is a different perspective based on uh, generational perspective. Um, and I think it's incumbent on both sides, the, an older generation to try to understand where younger people are coming from, their view, their experience, et cetera, and not be surprised that younger people view the world the way they do. Uh, they have a different set of experience. I think similarly, it is incumbent upon uh, a younger generation to understand uh, the history and to know their history. Young men and women like um, Ben McNally, who, as I like to call old souls, who have studied history, done their research, dig in, carry around wisdom and knowledge far beyond their years are very impressive to me. We're truly blessed to have a generation like that 
And I would encourage more and more people to take time out of their day. I know we're all busy, et cetera. We spend our life looking at our phone. But uh, to be a reader, someone who's read as much as Ben is, he, he was, he's, he's an impressive young man. If you're looking for someone to join you permanently, um, please reach out to him and, and hire the young man. He's an intern with us. He was an intern with the Cyber Brief. He was a, uh, an intern with uh, Clint Bruce, the Navy SEAL, and his group, Trident Response Group. Um, he's absolutely brilliant, hardworking, dedicated, and, um, and shows a lot of initiative. And this is the kind of young person that we need. And to his credit, he's very respectful of the past, but he also has his own uh, very clear views and experiences. And uh, I'm, I'm impressed with his ability to blend the two of those. So um, thanks again to Ben. Thanks to Suzanne. Thanks to the Admiral. Honored to have him. Honored to have him. And, and we really appreciate his service to our nation, keeping us all safe. We're going to take about a five or 10 minute break. We'll see an intermission sign up and uh, we'll be coming back here for more programming. And we appreciate your being with us today.